Boy, this uh, Tuesday webinar thing has gotten to be quite the habit. This is our third Tuesday in a row together, and I've even got a webinar scheduled for next Tuesday as well. More on that at the end. Well, welcome, welcome everybody. I'm Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we learn how to grow spring blooming hellebores. Uh, and I've got a beautiful patch of hellebores growing uh, near my front door, uh, and they are really my favorite early uh, spring flowers. So I'm kind of personally interested in learning more about the crop from today's guest experts. And we have two of them, and I'd like to introduce the first. She is the lovely April Herring Murray. April is in charge of new product development and marketing for Pacific Plug and Liner, uh, and she just so happens to be one of the most creative industry people I know. Welcome, April. Well, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Where are you? Uh, you know, one of the fun things, I always say this, fun thing about webinars is you can do them from any place you have an Internet connection. So where are you broadcasting from today, April? Today I am in sunny Watsonville, California, and that's right. It is sunny today. We're getting up to low 60s, so things are coming around, turning around for spring. It's been quite a, quite a bit of rain in California, in case you hadn't heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be out there in about, uh, about four uh, four weeks uh, for spring trials. How are things looking for that? It's looking fantastic, Chris. It's uh, a whole new setup for this year, so we're growing mostly perennials, but even though it's been rainy and cold, um, I think we're going to have a great show because perennials can take that kind of abuse. <laughs> All right, and I, I can tell our second guest is getting uh, antsy about getting on here. <laughs> And he is truly an expert, a specialist in fact. He, uh, in fact, he's uh, Bart Nordhaus, owner and breeder for Exceptio BV in Holland. Welcome, Bart. Thank you, Chris. All right. And Bart, um, where, you must be broadcasting from where? Scravendiel or Schiphol or uh, the Rijks <laughs> Museum right. or someplace? I, you're a Dutchman, I can tell. Where are you broadcasting from? I'm a Dutchman. I'm traveling in the U.S. In the US right now, and I'm in Pensacola, Florida. Pensacola, Florida. That's beautiful. <laughs> and you are—you actually you're uh, you're you're out there talking hellebores uh, exclusively, or hellebores and other crops to grow. Some other crops, but uh, mainly hellebores. We're testing customers at this moment. All right, and you're there with uh, Richard Gijo, who's sort of acting as associate producer in the background. You're using his laptop, I understand. So thank you for yes, that. Yes, I do. All right, now a couple. Oh, you know what? I didn't. Uh, wait a minute. Look here. I, I've got to get my slides going for. There's the good-looking Bart uh, Nordhaus. I think I left a D out of his name. Nordhaus, which means North House, right? Is that right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, definitely an outdoorsman. Nice looking shot there. And um, well, there's me. You know, doing my thing from the the 93rd floor of the Ball Publishing Tower. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping things before we dive right into it. If anybody can't hear, and I just saw a message from somebody, Jillian, um, if she can't hear, I'm hoping Jillian is now reading this and realizing how to get connected. If I had a, a, about, a, let's see, we have almost 100 people on right now. If I was getting hundreds of messages, I'd be worried, but it's just Jillian. She reads this, and then she'll figure it out, uh, I hope. Otherwise, I'll send her a quick message once we get going. Uh, second, if you have questions about uh, things we're talking about, uh, type them into either the chat or the Q&A area, uh, and I will field them. If you're on, um, on topic, I'll ask them maybe kind of right away. Otherwise, we'll save them for the end. Uh, and if something happens, you get kicked off the webinar, or you're, you got to go, a customer comes in or whatever, fear not. This webinar will be archived at the usual spot, ballpublishing.com slash webinars. Uh, and I'll give you that one again at the end. So I think that's all of the, uh, the housekeeping. April, you're going to take it away? I sure am, Chris. All right. Well, just dive in. And if I don't change the slides at the time you want me to, just I'll, say, I'll just change the slides. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. So today's topic, how to grow spring-blooming hellebores. And uh, we say spring-blooming because there's a few that, um, you know, they'll bloom earlier than spring. All right. So next up. There we go. Okay. So 
Um, just real quick, uh, the varieties that are commonly grown in the U.S. market today, we see Niger pipes, the, the one that's commonly sold during Christmas. Um, then we have, and they're always white. And then the Orientalis pipes, these are the types you see um, that they are all types of different colors and patterns. Usually, though, you only see a very extreme close-up of the flower. They don't really show the habit. Um, uh, and, uh, and then we have the hybrid types. And we'll go to the next slide. And these are the ones we're going to talk about today. Woohoo! Um, in particular, we're going to talk about the Frost Kiss varieties, because this is the, the um, series that we know the most about. And these are the series that Bart works on. So we'll move along. So you might be wondering why frost kiss hellebore and why hybrid hellebore. So one of the reasons is that we find in the U.S. is the Niger type of hellebore is blooming too early for uh, a lot of the growers. And so these are later to bloom. They're not um, going to be blooming at Christmas time. There might be a few that are a little earlier, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but for the most part, they're starting to bloom in January and through April, depending on your climate. Um, they're also heat tolerant, so, and I know that sounds weird, hellebore and heat tolerance, they usually don't go together, but um, through the breeding efforts of um, the uh, breeders that worked on the Frost Kiss project here, we have uh, in the bloodline um, some heat tolerant uh, species, so it leads to more heat tolerant varieties. Um, also, the guaranteed uniformity of the hybrid type of hellebores because these are born from tissue culture. A lot of the hellebores that we see on the market are from seed, and so they're not always even in uniformity uh, in the bloom, you know, color, and also the bloom timing. And four, the quicker to bloom. So, and by that, I don't mean they're going to bloom earlier. I mean, as in the, the time of year, but they're going to be quicker to bloom um, they will bloom in under a year. So one of the things that we see with the Orientalis type is because a lot of them are from seed, is that it can take uh, it can take more than a year to bloom. So there are lots of growers we visited, and they're like, oh, these just never bloomed. And it's like it's not until year two, even year three, before some of these varieties are blooming. And then, of course, with our Frost Kiss series, there's the high level of technical support that you would get um, not only through emails, um, but also um, Bart, um, who's on with us, he can do site visits and work with you with the WhatsApp um, application. You know, if you take a picture, hey, I'm having some problems, he can help you out. So that's the why Frost Kiss. So just real quick, the varieties that we have in the program, um, there's currently, um, this shows 12 varieties, but there is a new one that we'll talk about later. Um, so there's 13 varieties in the program. They're mostly um, very similar looking. There's a few differences between them. And um, we'll talk about that when we go to each variety. And this is the reason why uh, Bart and his team continue to breed. Um, even though some of the flower colors might look very similar, there might be some differences that are positive for our U.S. market, like maybe uh, it's a little bit later to bloom. So we're, for the U.S. market, we're always you know, looking for something that's even later to bloom because we want hellebores in the store when the traffic is in the store. And um, and so BART has quite the challenge because in Europe they want them earlier to bloom. So they are breeding for earlier blooming and also later blooming for the different markets. All right, so moving on. So we'll just run through the different varieties real quick so we can talk about the differences um, that you can see with these um, spring blooming type of hellebore. Now, Anna's Red, she, uh, this is a, a very dark red variety. This is one of the earlier ones in the Frost Kiss series. So if you're looking for something a bit earlier, this one can potentially bloom for you in December and, and go out to March with the dark red flowers. Um, then next, we have Biley's Blush. This one um, here, it's, it's a really new variety, so we don't have a whole lot of experience with it. But what I do know is it has a very bushy habit. Um, Lots of bloom power and that kind of bicolor um, flower with a kind of violet, creamy white flower. So a very interesting looking flower on that one. Very similar to Penny's Pink, if you've grown that one before. And next, new, so this is the newest one in the series. This is Charmer. 
And so part of what, um, and maybe Bart can explain a little bit more of some of the direction they're going with their breeding is breeding for larger flowers. So this one has some of the la largest flowers in the series, but this one is an earlier blooming variety. So if you were looking for like a red, maybe closer to Christmas, this could be your variety. Uh, Bart, can you explain a little bit about the direction of your breeding? Yes, we have actually two directions. We have the European direction, which is early, and we have the American direction, which is later. And uh, it seems in America the bigger flowers are more popular. So um, we're aiming at bigger, a bit more compact, and Charmer is a good example of that. It's a very compact habit. Um, large flowers, uh, big flowers also speckled inside, so you have a kind of uh, yeah, what, more contrast in the flower. And uh, yeah, easy to grow. That's also one of the things we are really aiming at. Our nursery background is not to, yeah, with the nursery background in mind, we have not the, the, the idea of growing the most beautiful and bringing the most beautiful flower, but growing the best growing flower. So um, more blooming, better blooming, bigger blooming, more compact for America later. That's actually a bit of the direction we are going to. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll move on to the next variety. We'll have Sheryl Shine is a light pink color, um, lots of blooms on it. Uh, this one, again, another new one, so we don't have a whole lot of experience with it, but we're looking, it's going to be very similar to Penny's Pink. And next. Okay, so the next two, what I've seen here in Watsonville is Dana's Still Set and uh, Dorothy's Dawn are both uh, quite a bit later and blooming from the rest of the series. So this might be something as we increase our supply on, you might try in your assortment to see if it also holds true in other parts of the country. But I've definitely seen a pretty big difference at least a few weeks later than, say, Penny's Pink on these varieties. So the next one is Dorothy's Dawn. Again, uh, part of what Bart is looking for is the later blooming for the American market. And so, like like I said, I had one customer, and he's like, why do you have these two hellebores? They look exactly the same. And it's because of that reason, trying to find the right varieties for the right market. All right, next. Uh, Glenda's Gloss, this is a real um, – attractive hellebore that a lot of people are interested in. Um, very, very interesting bicolor flower. This one is going to be more similar to Anna's Red in bloom time a little bit earlier. Um, uh, so keep that in mind for Glenda's Gloss. All right, next. Uh, Molly's White. Um, I think everybody needs a good white in their assortment. White is nice and bright at retail. And Molly's White is very vigorous, um, fills the pot very nicely. So this is a good choice uh, for a white. It, it really matches up well with Penny's Pink. And next, Moondance is a newer white variety um, that we just started with. So this one will have a more compact habit versus Molly, Molly's White. Similar bloom time, though. And next. And this is our flagship variety. This is Penny's Pink. This is, I think, where it all started um, uh, with the original breeder, uh, Rodney Davey, when he did a magical cross with multiple different species um, to create this uh, series of hellebore with the marbled foliage and colored flowers, compact, blooming in under a year. Um, but this is um, one of our most popular varieties. Lots of flowers, nice habit, very vigorous. Um, so this is where we, we started. So we can move on to the next one. Uh, now, Pippa's Purple, this is the one I was referring to that looks very similar to Penny's Pink. And so you're like, hmm, why do they need that one? This one, what we're seeing is that it's around two weeks later uh, to Penny's Pink. So if you're looking either A for a later one or maybe doing a spread so that, um, so that you can see uh, puts uh, product into stores at different timing of the year. All right, next. Almost. We're getting through these. Okay, Rihanna's Ruby. Um, so this one looks very similar to Anna's Red, but what we're seeing here is that it's way later than Anna's Red, and it seems a bit more compact in habit as well. So, um, so that is something that we're seeing here in Watsonville. So as this becomes more available, there's not much uh, supply now, but as it becomes available, it might be something to consider um, for a red in your assortment. And then, April, we, we've, we've got our first question. Hardiness. Oh, we do. Yes. Oh, okay. Hardiness. Good. Yes, we're getting into that. I, I, so, I figured that would come, but Laura, yes. Lauren's excited. She wants to know if they're hardy to zone four. I can tell she already wants every one of them. Yeah, uh, so zone four. We, we list them as zone five, but oh. you, 
you do. But that doesn't mean, I mean, you can always trial them. We're always willing to send trials and see how they do in a zone four environment. And of course, you know, depending on the weather, I mean, it's like, is it zone four today, like this year, or is it really a zone five this year? So it could be that, you know, for a while it survives in the, in the landscape and maybe if it get a really hard winter, it might not. Um, gotcha. So last but not least, we have Sally Shell, another lighter pink color, kind of like Cheryl Shine, but maybe a little bit more tight habit. Um, and again, just trialing out all the different um, types there. All right, so going into growing, since someone's starting to ask, here's our hardy. So this is growing at a glance. This is basically like a quick snapshot of what we're going to talk about um, for the remaining of the webinar. Um, so just hardiness zone, we are saying five to eight, and, you know, it's there's still, you know, trialing to be done. I know I have some varieties in, um, in trial gardens around the country, so we'll see if we can get the heart, like if the hardiness is even more so. Um, when to plant, we'll talk about planting schedules with the 72 cell and a 32 cell. Bloom period, we talked a little bit about that already with the varieties. You're looking at January to April and um, and how we can extend that bloom time or, or uh, stall it through temperature. And um, dimensions of most of these are 12 to 18 by 12, so a nice, nice size plant. Um, watering, we'll talk about watering, uh, the irrigation plus the fertilizing, uh, because hellebores are very different um, compared to most plants. And soil, I think it's funny because it always, it, like most people always say well-drained. I don't know of any plant that is really like it wants a soggy soil, so well-drained. Um, exposure. So a lot of people, they always are talking about plants they want for shade or part sun. So hellebore is perfect for this. And also, if you have an area in your nursery that is like the worst area for most plants because it doesn't have that much sun, it's great for the hellebore program. That's what we do here is we pick the darkest corner um, here at PPNL to grow these on, the darkest, coldest corner, and that's, that's they do perfect there. Um, growing temperatures, they're going to be on the cooler side, um, and I know, like, if you're looking at over-summering a hellebore, we'll talk about how you can regulate temperatures and keep them as cool as possible, because obviously it's not Watsonville everywhere, and you're going to get a lot higher temperatures than 70. Um, and then we'll talk about the pinching uh, growth regulator. You never need growth regulator for a hellebore. Don't do it. Don't even think about it. And then the crop timing, um, there's different types of crop timing. Fertilization, you're really just growing them cool. Um, they don't need a hard fertilization for bloom. And then liner sizes, we here at PPNL, we do a 72 cell and a 32 cell. And we recommend that those are planted and no bigger than a 2.5 quart to a one gallon to fill them up in time. All right, so next up. All right, April, we've got uh, an overwintering temperature question. Uh, uh, yes. Are you going to get into that more later on, or you want to tackle that we right will, now? We um, will, but we can t tackle it right now. Let's go for it. Okay, so this – I don't see who it came from. But the uh, overwintering temps, we heat to 32 in the winter to prevent the constant freeze-thaw we get in Virginia, but it results in earlier flowers. Do I need minimal winter heat, like 32, in a freeze-thaw area, or can you just let them get cold and – warm uh i'll let bart take that on because he's more the expert <laughs> <laughs> thank you um overwintering is possible in two ways you can have a minimum heated greenhouse the thing you get there is that the plants flower in a normal way so the normal time and it might be in february when you still have cold weather outside if you have them in a, a less heated greenhouse let's say you go to 20 degrees fahrenheit you will delay the flowers till after the frost. So it depends on the weather you get outside. If you get a real serious frost bite, let's say zero degrees, I recommend to heat the greenhouse a little bit to get the, the real cold off. But let them freeze for, let's say, 10 Fahrenheit, and the plants will go down. The leaves will hang down a little bit because they evaporate and they cannot uptake water, so they look a, a bit sad at that moment. They can be that way for a couple of uh, for a couple of weeks. If you have a real serious frostbite and you decide to go very cold in your greenhouse, you can also cover them with a little bit of winter cloth or fleece duke or whatever to prevent evaporation. And then you can 
Yeah, delay the flower by at least a month or more. So uh, these varieties that'll, that, that'll help it survive if the say goes up to 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the middle of winter in Virginia. That the fact that the plant is frozen will help it um, help it uh, survive that that little hot spell. Exactly. Exactly. The winter cloth will have will will minimize the, the temperature difference. Difference. There you go. All right. Very good. Thanks. All right. So we'll go into planting. Um, so we talked about that was just a quick snapshot summary of growing hellebore. And so now we'll go into schedules. Um, what we're recommending is that hellebores can be planted in two seasons, in the spring or in the fall. And you definitely do not want to plant them in the summer. Hellebores, they they go, um, they don't go really go dormant per se, but they don't grow during the summer. And so you don't want to plant them in the summertime because they're not going to grow and root in. Um, so the, the, we can go to the next slide. Now, how we do that this year at PPNL is we have two different programs for spring planting and for fall planting. For spring planting, we have the 72 cell, which is a smaller liner. And I actually, I should have put something for scale because they look like the same size liner in this picture, but the 32 cell is much bigger. Um, so the spring planted liner is the 72 cell. So you're, you're going to want to plant it as early as possible once the chance of frost has passed because you want as much time for the hellebore to establish itself before it starts to get hot outside. So with this planting schedule, you're looking at between 40 to 52 weeks of crop time. And I know some of you just had a mini heart attack because that is a very long crop time. Um, so if you are a grower that generally does not grow crops for that long, maybe the 32 cell is the option for you. Um, so the 32 cell is a program that we just started working with growers on where they would fall plant the hellebore. So they're missing the entire summer growing. They don't have to worry about it. And this is also great for growers that are in really hot climates. Um, so you don't have to worry about um, all the heat affecting the hellebore. Um, because I'm originally from Texas, and I know it gets hot in places. It's not Watsonville everywhere. So if you want to miss all that and you want to shorten your crop time, the 32 cell is the way to go. And you basically cut your crop time in half, but you still get a very good quality plant. And we'll look at some of those examples next. So here you see this is a crop that was um, grown in Smith Gardens in, Wa in Washington. Um, so this is hellebore. This is the penny's pink. And they planted these around week 18, which is a little on the late side for most people, but it's Washington. So it stays pretty cool there um, going into May and June. So they can get away with a little bit later planting. And the photo is taken in week five. Um, so you can kind of see that's a 72 cell production. And also take note in the left picture how nice and tight those plants are grown. So that'll come up uh, in an important uh, topic later on. So. All right, so next. Uh, April, Tom, Thomas wants to know pot size. Uh, pot size. You recommend for a 72 cell. We recommend for, um, for both 72 cell and for 32 cell, we recommend the, they call it the 2.5 quart to gallon size. So I know we've had several customers asking if they can grow a two gallon with this product, and it's just not enough time to fill a two gallon pot. There are people that have magical growing conditions that might be able to pull that off, but not most, not a lot of people. So we recommend 2.5 quarts to one gallon. You do tend to see hellebores at retail always in roughly the same size container. You don't tend to see four inch. You don't tend to see you don't see three gallon, for instance. Yeah. Gallon, so. <laughs> well, you only see bigger ones if it was a holdover. So they they have a, like some gallons from the year before, and they plant it into a two gallon for the next year. So and definitely the quart size. Yeah, you're not going to get your your uh, money back uh, on that because you know being in a more expensive go. product. All right, two point five to a gallon. Gotcha. All right, so now this is from our trials here in Watsonville, and I know what you're thinking, April, those don't look that impressive, um, but this, okay, so these were planted week 38. These were from a 32 cell. This is taken week one, so very first of the year, and if you look at the picture on the right, you can really see the bud development down at the base of the plant. So even though right now in this January photo, they look kind of ho-hum, this crop, 
we'll go to the next slide and I'll show you what they look like last week. So here they are last week. So all of those buds popped out. And this is Watsonville, so our weather is more mild. So we're getting um, development of the flowers a lot sooner than some areas of the country that are still very cold. But you can see using the fall planted 32 cell, it is possible to have a very nice crop of hellebore um, as long as all the growing protocols are followed. And take note of the spacing on the left. That's not a good spacing for hellebore. That was just for the purposes of the photo op. OK. Um, so we'll still in the planting topic. So a lot of you might be wondering, well, what is the best soil I should be using for a hellebore? Um, they, you know, like most plants, they want a well-drained soil with lots of air. Um, the pH, though, should be 5.5, so pretty acidic soil. And generally, a peat-based soil with some bark in it is the best type of soil to use. And when you're planting, be sure, um, and this is important for the, for the topic of temperature and root zone temperature for hellebore, always, because I know a lot of potting machines, and I see it here in, even in Watsonville, that goes, the pots go through the pot filler very quickly, and they might not fill to the top. Um, so it's very important to make sure that they are filling to the top and there's no gap between the top of the pot and the soil surface because that just causes the, um, the sun to heat up that part of the pot and just heat up the roots even more. And then also is recommended that you plant the liner just a little bit deeper than the soil surface to help promote the flower bud development. And we'll see some pictures of this next. So here you can kind of see on the left is there's a big gap. We'll have a close-up next. And then on the right is, is completely full. So you can go to the next slide. And you see the, that's a no-no. Don't leave a big gap. And then, yes, yeah, fill it to the top. And then next, you'll see the liner. It's a little hard because the foliage is, is uh, kind of dark. But we buried it just a little bit um, just to help increase that bud count. So that's interesting. You really want to fill that top right to the rim, in other words. Yeah, and Bart can talk a little bit to that. Yeah, the issue with the hellebores is the root temperature. So as soon as the sun hits the pot, the black surface of the pot will heat up. And a rim is a black surface, and it will transfer the heat into the root zone. As soon as the root temperature comes above the leaf temperature, a hellebore stops growing. And for one day, that's okay. For two days, it becomes less. And if you have it more than a week, you will set down the growth of a hellebore by more than a month. So it is very important to keep the roots cool. And you can do that by filling the pots completely to the top. And also by spacing them, uh, actually not put a pot thick. It's much better. We will so come why, to that why, issue. Why not, why not white pots? Not that you can white pots. Nursery. <laughs> nursery <laughs> If you like it, it's is possible. But there's one issue with white pots, and we, we, we encountered it in the past. White pots let the sunshine through. And something a hellebore does not like is light at the roots. So make sure if you have a white pot that is black inside, that the sun light will not come through the pot. Interesting. All right. All right. Well, speaking of spacing, this is a big, big important topic for hellebore. Um, because it's very opposite of the way growers think. You know, you think, oh my gosh, the plants are getting a little big, space them, you know, or let's just space them from the very beginning. So with the Frost Kiss series, because they're bred for production and um, with efficiency in mind, they can stay pot thick until almost until you're ready to ship them. You can space them out a little bit. But it's good to keep them as, as close together as possible to prevent the sun to shine on the pots because of the very reason that the roots heating up, like Bart mentioned. It just, the hellebore, do, it just really um, sets back the hellebore and it can even um, get to a point where it causes uh, plant death if they are too hot. So to do this, we recommend the triangular spacing. So instead of just like, uh, you know, side by side, kind of stagger them a little bit, but as close as possible from the very beginning, they should be touching. And then as they get later in the season, like in the fall, when they start to bud up, you might space them a little bit, but the leaves should still be shading all of the pot. And make sure that the, it's best, I mean, I can't, you know, if it's already, your, your place is already done, but it's best if the beds are north-south orientation. 
Um, all right, so next. So here is an example. On the left is not correct. This is this is how you get you see all the exposed pots and how all the sun could just hit those black pots and you can even go and pick up a pot of anything that you have outside where the pot is exposed and just pull out the plant, touch the roots and feel how hot they are on that side. And this the hellebore just absolutely hates. And so on the right you can see there's a picture and you can't even see the ground and that's perfect. And um, and it's not going to because these um, these uh, varieties are bred for production. They're not going to get stretchy. I mean, I've had them like super thick here in trials, and we'll pull them out, and they look perfect. All right. So next, see, no, and yes, and next. Okay. So here's a picture um, that we took in the trials here, where we had some that were exposed to the this. Um, the pot was exposed. On the right is the root ball where the pot was exposed to sun, and you can see how it just killed off the roots because they were just constantly being um, heated up. And one of the things is you never want the root temperature to exceed the leaf temperature on a hellebore because that just causes a lot of issues. Um, one thing to mention that I didn't put on the slide is also most people grow on the ground, but per chance you're growing above ground, like on a table, you really don't want to do that for hellebore. As close to the, you want them close to the ground. You want them on the ground because the ground keeps the roots cold. So you want them pot thick and on the ground, in the shade, and that's just going to keep them as cold as possible. All right, now on to irrigation. So, um, the hellebore, again, this is going back to the temperature and, and how they like to be kept cool. Um, you're not going to want to water them at the hottest time of the day because that's when the leaf temperature is pretty hot, but the water is cold. And so it just causes a big shock and stress to it. Um, the best way to water a hellebore is drip irrigation. I know that not everybody has that type of, um, you know, option. So um, if not, then just make sure you're watering them. I mean, the best time to water them is early in the morning. If you have to, later in the evening when things have cooled down a bit. Um, also, with, you can see on the picture on the right, that's drip irrigation uh, grown hellebore. They're still keeping them nice and close together. Um, and uh, it also helps. Um, with disease management because the water is staying on the soil and you can also have better fertilizer management because you can really get, like if you need to feed heavy, you can do it with the drip irrigation and not get fertilizer on the, on the foliage. All right, next up. Speaking of fertilizer, this one I'm going to hand off to Bart because he is the expert in, in this topic and I think he could talk to it a lot better than I can. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hellebores need uh, more fertilizer than everybody thinks, especially in the autumn when um, the flowers are initiated. Like every perennial, actually, when the flowers are initiated, the need for food is there. So, opposite a lot of uh, uh, perennials, hellebores do flower in, in fall and winter, and actually early spring. So that's the time you normally don't feed. But a hellebore likes a lot of fertilizer, and we recommend that EC level in the soil directly measured in the soil between 1 to 1.2 to 1.5 EC. We have a technical sheet where all the, 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 the ingredients of fertilizers are mentioned on, and you can, we can send it by email. But if you have a low fertilizer level in your soil, uh, you can encounter a hellebore with just four or five flowers, while if you have the same hellebore, well fertilized, you can encounter hellebore with 25, 30, 40 flowers, depending on how big the pot size is. So the fertilizer levels actually, yeah, makes a difference between a well-selling plant and a failure. So, yeah, actively growing, even in winter time, when you think everything is not growing, a hellebore will grow. So we recommend fertilizer, fertilizer levels 1.2 EC to 1.5 throughout the whole year. And if possible, if you are not able to do that with slow release, go to liquid fertilizer, go to top dressing, whatever you want, but measure the EC frequently. An EC drop, let's say from 1.2 to 0.5 for more than a couple of days will set back the growth by almost a month. So you have an idea how important it is to keep on fertilizing them. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's most of the fertilizer issues. All right. Temperature. You pick, oh, go, get up on the yeah. temperature again? No, go ahead, Bart. You're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Temperature is actually the same. The higher the root temperature will go, the lower the uptake of fertilizers. Um, even in warm climates, when you talk about 80, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, a hellebore will grow if you do the thing like spacing and, 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 the, and, the, and the watering at the, at the right way. So you can keep them growing, but as soon as the temperature goes up and one of the other two is out of balance, the hellebore stop growing. Even in winter time, when it's still freezing and the temperature comes above uh, 32 a little bit, the hellebore starts growing again and starts picking up where it left before the frost. You can delay a hellebore uh, by getting them very cold. Uh, temperatures 10 degrees Fahrenheit in the greenhouse, a hellebore will survive, it's no problem. You will delay the flowers, sometimes for more than a month, depending on how long the frost will take. Only through very, very long frost periods, cover them with a fleece cloth, a winter cloth, or something like that to prevent evaporation. The leaves will go down, some early flowers will hang down like they're drying up, but as soon as the frost is over, they will pick up, they will start evaporating again, or growing again actually, and, and the hellebore will continue where it left before the frost. If you have a minimum heated greenhouse, the hellebore will keep on flowering, and when it's outside freezing, your sales in the, in the shops are not there. So we recommend in very cold areas, give them a little bit of frost, let them freeze, cover them with fleece juke, and it will delay the flowering till the frost is over. And by that time, the shops start to open. Bart, we have a couple of, couple of quick questions that are uh, roughly on this topic. Uh, Jim wants to know, he says, we plant our hellebores during the summer. Uh, how would we provide appropriate care in the finished container, starting them in, in, in the heat of summer? Well, in the heat of summer is something I would not recommend. Depending where you are in the country, in the north you start potting later, in the south you can start potting really early. But actually April is the latest you would plant a hellebore. If you do it in the summertime, you're very close to a failure already in the beginning. So if I recommend, if I may recommend, do a 32 cell in the fall or a 72 in early spring, but not in the summer. The summer planting is something you really want to avoid. All right, good. Gary wants to know about the NPK ratio for a slow release fertilizer in a cool uh, climate. In a cool climate, I would recommend something like a 27, 15, 12. A little bit higher on the phosphate than a lot of people think because the phosphate is uh, very important with allergors. There is some, um, yeah, NPK in a slow release. I don't know all the osmico types out of my head, but in the technical sheet we have, there's a more um, detailed uh, fertilizer regime. So it might help right. that we can send it to him. Okay. And he also uh, wants to know uh, multiple applications uh, every, say, two to three months or use a longer release fertilizer, say, six to nine month uh, uh, duration. Uh, depends on where you are in the country. But let's say you are in Seattle area. Seattle is a very nice, cool area with, okay, they have, they have nice summer temperatures, but not that hot as you have in the middle of the country. Then you can choose for, let's say, 12, 14 months or 8, 9 months. But what we also do is sometimes mix a 5, 6 months together with a 12, 14 months osmocote or slow-release fertilizer. It doesn't have to be particular osmocote. But the 5, 6 months, in general, have a more nitrogen-based uh, nitrogen. And the, the, the longer uh, durations, like 12, 14 months, have a high potassium rate in it. And high potassium is not always good for a hellebore because if you have high potassium and you keep them very compact, you will get enough flowers, but you miss a lot of growth. Especially in autumn, the hellebore likes a lot of nitrogen in combination with iron. So it's better then, if you want to use only slow release fertilizer, to use a 5 6 months together with 12 40 months mixed. And what you can do is take in total of 4 to 5 kilograms per cubic meter. I don't know what it is per cubic yard. We come from Europe, so we, we use the, the, the cubic meters, but it, you can calculate that. And if the hellebore starts growing well, you always can use an extra osmocote tablet or slow-release fertilized tablet. You yeah, have those tablets of 5 grams and 7 half grams. You can push it in the pot when the plants really start growing and you feel that the fertilizer levels are getting too low. It's always better to use a liquid fertilizer, but if you don't have, tablets will do the job also very good. 
All right. Similar question. Lauren wants to know. She starts her plants in September, overwinters them in a cold greenhouse. Should she apply a slow release right when she plants? Uh, yes. Still in autumn, the temperature is high enough to uh, release so, slow release fertilizer. But when the temperature comes lower than 12 degrees Celsius, the release amount of release is very slow. Slow release fertilizers. So when you encounter cooler temperatures, I recommend also some liquid feeding. All right, and then a couple of quick pH questions, since I just saw a couple pop up. Uh, April, you said 5.5 pH. Drew wants to know why. And then Victor is asking the ideal pH of growing soil. For just, so just a little bit on, on pH, Bart. Okay, pH is, uh, it depends where you are in the country and how much carbonate you have in the water. But pH is very important with hellebore. Uh, with an average pH of 5.5, the uptake of the, ma the macro and the micro elements are actually very good. If you go higher than 6, you miss a lot of nutrients which have been uptaken, especially the micro elements. Phosphor, or sorry, phosphor, phosphor will be uptaken uh, uh, less, but like I said, phosphate, uh, sorry, phosphate, potassium, for example, has been uptaken by candy. The higher the pH, how better the uptake of uh, potassium. And potassium slows down the growth. And what you actually want in the summertime is fast growth from the hellebore because they go in a kind of, well, you call it dormancy, but it's not a kind of dormancy. They grow underground. On top of the pot, you will not see too, many, too much growth, but underground, the hellebore is working. So when you have a lot of potassium in it the, and your pH is going up, your potassium uptake will be getting more and more and more. So that slows down the growth of the hellebore. So the ideal situation is to have a pH around a year of 5.5. But again, imagine if you have a, an area where you have a lot of carbonate in the water, then you start, for example, with 5, because the pH will go up during the season. If you have an area where your water is more acidic, you can go up with 5.8 or 6 in the beginning, and then it slows down your fertilizer a little bit during the season. So it depends where you are, what kind of water you have. But try to be around the 5.5. You will read in a lot of books that a pH of 6.5 is recommended, but that is actually for niger types. It's not for the hybrids. The hybrids need a lower pH. Well, April, you're right. He does know his stuff. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll go into exposure. So, again, you know, these are great plants for shady areas, partly sunny areas. So in the summer months, if you're growing your hellebores through the summer, you definitely want to put some shade up at 30 to 35 percent um, to prevent the overheating and um, burning of any of the foliage. And also, it's, again, going back to that spacing, making sure the pots are staying uh, pot thick, can tight, so, and on the ground, so they're as cool, uh, they keep the roots as cool as possible. Um, and, that, and then that way, um, when you have the shade over the crop, and then also the crop is can tight, you're getting very little exposure onto the pots. Um, so, uh, so the hellebore can survive that summer, that hot summer uh, condition. And like Bart said, they're still growing. They're, you just don't see the top growth, but they're really producing a big root mass for the, you know, for their bloom season later on. Uh, pinching. I know, as growers, we all want to make a nice looking plant. You always think, want things nice and tidy and, um, you know, uh, and people just want to trim things if they're a little out of place. Never, ever pinch a hellebore. It's like cutting an arm off of it. Um, so these, the hellebores throughout the growing season, um, every leaf is helping to produce a flower. If you're trimming off leaves while they're growing, you're just reducing your flower count. Um, and so you might, at time of shipping, you might clean them up a little bit. Um, but other than that, you'll never pinch a hellebore. So we'll show the next picture. Only one plant was harmed for this presentation, the poor thing. Never pinch a hellebore. So this is a hellebore pinched, and it's very sad. <laughs> so that means I shouldn't clean mine off in the landscape and kind of whack them back like I do all my other perennials? Well, Bart can answer that. You can clean them up a bit, like you can trim off the old flowers, but you never want to hack it back like the photo here. Ooh. I knew yeah, I learned only, something. The only thing you can do with a hellebore, if you want to pinch it and clean it in landscape, is uh, at flower time. Flower time is the only period you don't harm a hellebore when you cut off a few leaves. 
Uh, kind of yep. like an azalea, I guess. Do it right after it blooms, otherwise you're cutting off the new the new flowers. Exactly. Well, with hellebore, it's not cutting off the new flowers, but you're cutting off the lungs. Oh, that's not <laughs> You're cutting off assimilation. I won't do so. it. I... <laughs> All right. Thanks. Yeah, and even yeah. So see, this this yeah. hellebore is very That's sad. That's me right now. Yeah, and especially like a lot of times growers, like especially for our 32 cell, it's quite a large liner, and they'll be very tempted to trim it before they plant it. But don't do it. Um, just resist, because um, if you trim it, you're going to set it way back. So, um, so that's the topic of pinching. Um, last up for growing, we're going to talk real briefly on insects and diseases. And the reason I say brief is because there's not very many diseases in hellebores. Um, the leaves are super thick. Uh, the plant, once we get through the hard part of weeding the tissue culture, the, the easy, you know, growing them, you know, the diseases is very little. You might see a little bit of botrytis in the flowers. Um, but again, with uh, proper water management, you won't see too much of this, um, especially if you're using drip irrigation, keeping that top foliage dry. Um, occasionally with insects, you might see some aphids or spider mites. Um, but in general, we have our hellebores here and we just kind of, you know, we, never, we don't have to do too much management on insects and diseases with hellebore at all. All right, so in summary, I think that's all the growing information we have to present. If there's any more questions on growing, we can definitely take those. Um, but, you know, uh, We've got a help. few in here. Oh, good. Okay, good. Uh, first, Gary just mentioned he has he sees botrytis issues in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, of course, you know, cool and, and, and wet up there, so I could understand why they might have a little bit more. Uh, let's see. We had a couple of questions. I want to. Oh, here we are. Um, something about a veil. Oh, uh, this from uh, my buddy Paul. Uh, April, you mentioned no PGRs. He's asking about configure, which is often used to increase the number of shoots. Do you have any experience using configure, or did you mean you know no PGRs or similar <laughs> chemicals whatsoever? We, I personally, maybe Bart has experience. I personally have no experience um, doing uh, putting growth regulators of any type on hellebore. In general, I mean, they definitely don't need um, any uh, like PGR for height management. Um, in general, they stay a nice compact habit. Uh, the varieties that we offer, but yeah, I've never tried a branching type of uh, PGR. Bart, have you? Yeah, we suddenly we have a lot of uh, growers in Holland who are doing nitrous and all kinds of things from our competition, and they always use PTRs. And they want to use in our varieties as well, and we have such, seen such bad results, and most of the results are the plants are getting very small. The flower size is half of what it should be, and the amount of flowers is way less than half of it. So PTR on the Frosty series, I say a big no. Yeah, and if you look at that plant on the left in the picture, I don't know really how you could improve upon that. So. <laughs> Yeah, what, uh, what, would you, what would you get shorter on it? Yeah, uh, Don wants to know um, to delay flowering. Can the final for the final month? Can you put the plants in a cooler uh, with no lights? Yes, we have done trials on that. Uh, when the buds are still in initiation, so not coming out of the ground, you can cool them almost for two months. And the ideal temperature should be around 30 to 32 degrees, so just freezing. Yeah, and we actually we actually do that for spring trials as well, Chris. Uh, so there's some in the cooler as we speak. <laughs> yeah, Josh is Josh is weighing in that he's he's seen that flowers will stay smaller if you use a, a PGR. Yeah. Um, now here's uh, let's see. John wants to know in northern climates when your old leaves turn brown over the winter, is it okay to cut those leaves off um, when the plant flowers, uh, when the flowers and the new leaves are emerging in the spring? In other words, just clean it up. Yes. I think you said yes, absolutely. Yes, you don't want to sell it with dead. You don't want to sell it with dead leaves. I mean, of so course you have, to, you have to clean it, but it, at, at flower time, it's no problem. Right. Got a question about uh, pricing, but we'll uh, maybe save that for. a Private one. Uh, well, although, let's see. Let's see. The suggested retail ste seems low. <laughs> April, twelve dollars really? to fourteen well, ninety eight. That's exciting. <laughs> that's exciting if that's a low Lisa, price. Lisa okay. says raise your prices. Okay. Right. Well, that's that's kind of 
kind of, it is for, you know, more of the box store type of pricing for that retail. Um, for the independent garden centers, yeah, you can definitely go higher than that. Uh, that these are just some pictures. This is, um, you know, how can it look in a retail um, situation? We did a setup last week with our hellebore, so you can see um, bring in, you know, if you have some bigger specimens, um, but also just these are the um, the 2.5 quart size. Um, hellebore, so I mean, just a really nice presence at retail to get the store traffic in that early spring season. And this is a real life scenario. This is a, at an actual store, one of our customers um, that has products. So you can see how showy that uh, hellebore is at retail as well. And again, you know, to grow the hellebore uh, program to have that nice of finish, you know, you have the two planting seasons in summary, spring and fall. And following the growing um, advice that we have, you can produce a really nice plant. Um, but, you know, through the presentation, you can hear by a few key things you do wrong can really delay and set back the plant and have a lesser quality plant. So we have um, lots of information available, including our brochure with all the, um, the uh, descriptions of all the varieties. But we also have a growing manual. And um, if you're interested, we can email that as well. It's very, it's 12 pages long, so it's very detailed. Um, and then, of course, we have Bart. He's working with us closely. He comes to the US quite often. And he can um, not only help through email, or he can sign you up to his WhatsApp group growing group, um, and then he can um, also, if you're interested in a site visit, um, if you want to really get to him to get to know your crop and your, your site and how, you know, what works best for you, we can arrange that as well. And last but not least, is it available? So a lot of the problems in the past of Hellebore has also been availability. And because we're working very closely with Bart and his team and direct, um, you know, and directly with the lab, it's a very, it's just a small little triangle of people that are working together on this project. So we have very good communication um, on building these programs. And so the availability has never been better for Hellebore for us. Um, and it's only getting stronger. So they, um, the newer varieties of, are always going to have less availability at first, but we'll grow them. Um, but we have fantastic availability on some of the uh, first varieties out, like Penny's Pink and Anna's Red. And always check our linerability. We're already posting. So we have 2017 um, availability now. And, um, but we also have posted 2018 availability. So check that out. And April, someone, someone was asking about trial varieties. We have that available. You can contact me. I always pull aside a lot of the new, um, like a, a block of the new stuff, and um, and um, I can send out uh, varieties of that. Sorry, my phone is talking to me. I don't know why she just decided to. Okay. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, I think I already said that a couple times, but um, so. Uh, for those of you coming to spring trials, or if maybe you haven't thought about it, hopefully um, you can make the trek out and um, come to visit uh, uh, us at PPNL. We are changing things up uh, quite a bit this year. We're featuring mainly perennials. Some of our vendors will have a few annuals here and there, um, but it's mostly perennial. So if you're very interested in perennial, it's a great place to see a lot of assortment, not just our own. We have product showcases. Um, from various breeders. Um, and then also, Bart will be on hand at the spring trials. So if you want to meet him in person and chat, he's available for the whole event. Well, and I can vouch for the fact that April does it way over the top. So you know you're going to be issued a camp and a, a hat and a merit badge. You'll That's be right. uh, cross legged <laughs> on the floor starting fires. When she says camp perennial, you're going to get the full experience. Yeah, we're, we're building. It's getting a little crowded in my office here. It's starting to look like an episode of Hoarders. But, uh, but yeah, we're getting excited for the event. And um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun um, and really highlight perennials because one of the things that you don't see a whole lot of at spring trials is perennials. You see a lot of annuals. So it'll be fun. More and more. All right. 
Well, we've got, uh, we always take a little time for, for Q&A. We've answered virtually every question that's sort of answerable. There's a few on pricing and availability that I think you're best off emailing April directly, and her email is going to pop up in the very next slide. Mark, however, wants to know, how long can you hold a 72 cell uh, that's listed as a week 12 availability? Can it be held for early May shipping? Uh, yes, it can. Um, and, uh, yeah, we don't want to ship it too much later than May because we want you to plant it early enough so that you have time to finish, you know, on time or to grow into the pot before the summer heat hits. But, yeah, it definitely holds. Um, it'll hold until May. Yeah, and Bart warned against planting after April, so you want to watch out. Well, yeah, certain areas, though, you can do it. So uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, depending on where you're located, um, you could do it, a like I said, in the Pacific Northwest, they can plant them a little bit later because their summers are very mild. But if you're in the Deep South, then no. <laughs> All right, and then somebody else is asking about the growing manual, and um, I'm gonna, you're going to see the email. Let's see if you've got more questions. Here's how we'll have anything, anything you need, any more questions. If you want Bart to swing by your greenhouse and move in. How, Bart, how much longer are you in the States? Just almost two weeks. Two more weeks. So uh, yes. wouldn't it be great? This guy knows so much. Man, that's uh, <laughs> I'm, amazed. I'm, already, I'm already fully booked this couple, couple of two weeks. So, uh, oh, two next weeks. time. <laughs> next time. All right. Well, if you want, have questions, there's uh, April H at PP and L dot net and Bart is at bart at exceptio.nl. So um, that's pretty much uh, it. Let's see. Oh, I do have, if anybody wants to relive this, uh, go get the, the, uh, get the details uh, from some of the slides. Share it with your, uh, your colleagues or your boss or your employees or whoever. Uh, within an hour or so, uh, it should be archived at the same place you sign up, ballpublishing.com forward slash webinars. And I did mention that uh, this has become a Tuesday routine. And next Tuesday, we're doing another webinar, this time on those pesky annuals. Sorry, April. Uh, <laughs> get more from your proven winner's plants. It's uh, Tuesday, March 14th at 1 o'clock Eastern noon Central. Well, that is it for today on, ha on behalf of April, Bart, uh, Richard, my associate producer in the background there, and all the folks at Pacific Plug and Liner and my stellar staff at Ball Publishing who, uh, who work hard so that I don't have to, I'm Chris Beatty saying, Happy Serial Day, everybody.